continuing with our second phase of this course where we are looking at the foundations of data science. If you recall, we discussed in the last lecture that an important part of this component is to try and understand and characterize how sparse data or sparsity in data can be mathematically captured. Because if we know how sparse data is, but we might have lots of data, we can use sparsity to our advantage by focusing on those elements that matter to us and by and large ignore the elements that don't. That's the philosophy. Turns out that there is a very deep but interesting connection that we can leverage here based on this concept of Fourier analysis and the template through which we will be looking at computation um, are families of Boolean functions. I just want to uh, credit the source material for this including the notation, the treatment as well as the presentation is from Professor O'Donnell's book which is listed prominently as the source. And we also want to thank uh, Ashutosh Ingol of IIT Madras who collaborated with us actively on preparing these slides. So the background material we saw in the last lecture is going to be used quite substantially as we move forward in developing this concept of Fourier analysis as it relates to Boolean functions. The topics are broadly broken into three groups. We will just recapitulate what Boolean functions are and those of you who are curious can look up for yourselves that there is a space of representations of such functions which form something called a Hamming cube, but that is an aside. The second we actually dive into the concept of Fourier expansions using uh, Boolean functions as our basis and there are two technical subtopics that will play an important ro role here, multilinear polynomials and the Fourier expansion which builds on multilinear polynomials as well as the concept of parity functions which will play an important role because we will build on parity functions to create a basis for our Fourier expansion which is very efficient. And we again recall we have already defined what, what an orthonormal basis is and in case you are wondering we are going to be leveraging quite substantially the concept of a vector space. So Boolean functions as a quick recap, uh, essentially quite a good bit of computation can be thought of as evaluating Boolean functions if not all of it. So the input to such a function is a sequence of bits and the output is uh, some function of the input bits. You have already seen for example Boolean satisfiability in discussing NP completeness that uh, forms essentially a Boolean function, so the formulae that you see in Boolean satisfiability that is. And you basically map these bit sequences into either an integer or a real number. So when you are computing say the mean of bits or that is a typical example you can think of uh, as an example of a Boolean function, but you could also have and this happens a lot a Boolean function whose output is just a single bit. Here is a uh, naturally occurring example. You are given a graph and you are asked whether the graph is connected and just to remind ourselves that means we are asked whether there is a path from every node in the graph to every other node. If it is not, we return a value 0. If the answer is yes, we return a value 1. And based on this perspective, we will start this entire segment of this course focusing on trying to understand Boolean functions in depth. A very general way of defining a Boolean function f is to take n bit inputs which basically 
are drawn from in a standard sense that set 0 and 1 and map it into the set of real numbers. So, that is the most general form. It is very convenient for us to consider a form of a Boolean function here that is very useful for this topic alone where the inputs are not 0 and 1, but instead we associate minus 1 with 0 and plus 1 to be 1. So, our functions till we see otherwise in the near term next say 20 minutes uh, would be taking the form of mapping n tuples or strings of length n made up of minus 1 or plus 1 into the values again minus 1 or plus 1 a simple modification. So, if you take this uh, example here a Boolean function which returns the maximum of two input values then you have the function max 2, 2 indicating the number of inputs then you have inputs possibly minus 1 and plus 1 and given a pair. So, when you write using our standard notation minus 1 plus 1 raised to the power 2 that means these are 2 bit, two bit values they map again into minus 1 plus 1. So, let us look at all four possible inputs to the max 2 function. So, you have max 2 with possible input values plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and minus 1 minus 1. So, that returns values plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and minus 1 which is obvious that that is the maximum. So, in terms of the vector representation of Boolean functions more generally given such a represent uh, uh, say max 2 as an example uh, you would be taking these n bit va values which can uh, have 2 to the n possible instances. So, in the previous example we had 2 bit inputs. So, you had 4 possible inputs total and you can start thinking of injecting one value or one string at a time into the function thereby getting an output. So, in the case of the max 2 function let us consider the four vectors plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and minus 1 minus 1. So, the four outputs are plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 and minus 1 which can be written as a column vector uh, which you see on the slide as uh, a vertical vector written immediately below the four inputs. So, given any Boolean function you can fix some order for the inputs run this inputs through the Boolean function and then get a vector of these outputs written as a column vector. For convenience we will consider such vector representations of Boolean functions. And now if you also recall we had the concept of a basis based on a concept of a vector space and in particular we discussed something called a standard basis. All that machinery is now going to prove to be useful in analyzing Boolean functions. So, as we have you introduced this notation let bold V be the vector space of all possible Boolean functions with n input bits. Okay. Now, we have switched back temporarily into the world where our inputs are 0 and 1 and not the specialized case we were mapping into plus 1 and minus 1, uh, but we will return to that when we get back into the Fourier representation. So, again we have 2 to the n possible input strings and we take a particular special Boolean function from all possible Boolean functions which has this property. So, the function will give a value 0 all the time for any input except for the first string. So, you took the 2 to the n strings ordered them and passed them through the function string at a time. It returns a value 1 for the first string and 0 for every other string. Now, we have a second function does the same thing except it does it only for the second function uh, second input string and 
so on. So, we could build on this idea where you have let us say the ith function of this family that outputs a value only for the ith string of 1 and then 0 for every other 2 to the n minus 1 strings. It is easy to see that we have 2 to the n such Boolean functions which give a value of unity for a particular string and 0 for every other string. Okay. Now, think about the vector representation namely the output vector representation for each of these functions. What you have is for the first function a 1 in the first row of the column vector for and for the other functions a 1 in subsequent rows. So, in particular for the ith function a 1 in row i. It, this set of vectors we claim form a basis for vector space V of Boolean functions and in particular it forms also a standard basis food for thought. So, I suggest convincing yourself that the set of all Boolean functions first obeys from the previous lecture all of the 8 requirements of a vector space just walk through item by item it is easy to see that it does and that is where you will also see that going back to Boolean functions with values 0 and 1 is important and think about the following 2 hints as a way of working through the exercise. The vector space is 2 to the n dimensional and each in uh, distinct input uh, string that uh, is run through this function it corresponds to a dimension. So, there is a one to one correspondence between an input string and a dimension in particular through the output column vector. Okay. Uh, so, we have already mentioned what the vector space ought to be, but without looking at what we said could you also try and deduce for yourself how a standard basis for this vector space could be derived. This requires us to simply apply all the definitions from the previous lecture of what a vector space is leading up to what a standard basis is. Now, we also define the inner product. So, we will revisit that briefly. So, now that we have vector space V the inner product of say 2 Boolean functions and we are back to our specialized notation now where the inputs take on values minus 1 and plus 1 instead of uh, 0 1 and we have these 2 functions and we want their inner product. So, in the standard form you would simply evaluate the functions f on input x, g on input x where input x is an n bit string or an n tuple built of values minus 1 plus 1 and multiply them and take the sum over all such inputs correct. So, for present purposes it is a little more convenient to think of these particular inner product as not being written in the standard form, but instead by dividing it by a value 2 to the n which is very reminiscent of perhaps an average value. So, in, in fact we will see in a minute that it can be modeled uh, strictly as an average or a, uh, an expectation in a strict probabilistic sense uh, on this slide. So, formally in our current definition given functions f and g with n input bits using our current convention the inner product is you can think of it as the standard inner product times 1 over 2 to the n. Now, why did I mention that this is perhaps similar to an average or an expectation? If you think about taking the, uh, the 2 to the n possible inputs to f and g and drawing them uniformly from the possible set of all inputs which is a set of size 2 to the n then the expectation with a uniform probability distribution is 
exactly the same value as our current definition of an inner product, something that can be verified in all of less than 5 minutes, but a useful way of thinking about inner product for our present purposes.